near sacrifice anyway. Abraham was told by God to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. So he brought his only son, Isaac, up to the mountain. As I said, this is only about a mile away from where Jesus is crucified. To offer him as a sacrifice. And if you recall the story, when they get there, Isaac carries the wood for the sacrifice up the mountain. Just as Jesus carried the wood and cross to the place where he would be crucified. When they get to the top of the mountain, Isaac asks his father, Father, where's the, the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham responds, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. The author of Hebrews wrote, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Hebrews 11, 19, that's the New Living Translation. So this sacrifice and resurrection of Isaac is a foreshadowing of the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus. God provided that sacrifice. He provided his only son for the sins of mankind on that mountain over 2,000 years ago. God's glory was revealed that day on Calvary. It was revealed in the cross of Jesus. So let's pick it up in verse 44. It was now about the sixth hour. There was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While well, the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. So Jesus has been on that cross since 9 o'clock in the morning. It is now 12 noon, about the sixth hour. And so for three agonizing hours, he's been on that cross. At 12 noon, there's a darkness that begins covering the land. And it would continue to cover the land until 3 p.m. This was no ordinary darkness. The darkness covering the land was caused by God. He brought the darkness on. Not a solar eclipse, as some have tried to reason. The Passover is held at the full moon. That's why the dates change every year. It's held on a full moon. A solar eclipse only happens when the moon is in the new moon phase. This was a full moon. So like the star that led the wise men to the place where the young king of Israel was living, God, who was in control of the universe, covered the land with darkness. Now the New King James says, when the sun, then the sun was darkened, meaning darkness covered the land first, and as it grew, it covered the sun, it blocked out the sun. And there could only be one explanation for this. This is not a naturally occurring event. It was a supernatural act of God. This darkness was so thick that you would have had to grope your way around it what should have been broad daylight, because you couldn't see what was right in front of you. That's how thick the darkness was. It was a darkness that covered the land for three hours, much longer than any natural occurring eclipse. Galician, a Greek historian, wrote this. In the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, which, by the way, just happened to be A.D. 33, the time of the crucifixion, there was the greatest eclipse of the sun, and it became night in the sixth hour. So the stars even appeared in the heavens. There was a great earthquake in Bithynia, and many things were overturned in, Ni in Nicaea. So Philegion describes this, this darkness that covered the land. And he describes it at the exact time and the exact day when Jesus was being crucified. And he explained it the only way that he could explain it, that it was an eclipse. That's all he knew. But this was no ordinary natural occurrence. In addition, he writes of an earthquake that accompanied the darkness. And we, we read about that in Matthew's Gospel. Tertullian, another historian and apologist, he wrote about the darkness. At the moment of Christ's death, the light departed from the sun and the land was darkened at noonday. Which wonder is related in your own annals as preserved in the archives to this day? So Tertullian states that not only did this darkness occur, but it's also recorded in your historical archives. That darkness in the scripture has been used to describe many things. It's been used to describe the glory of God, and we find that in Exodus and in 1 Kings. 
The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Exodus 20, verse 21. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 12. So how did God conceal his glory in the crucifixion? We're going to look at that in a few moments. So that's the darkness that covered the land. Now I'm going to take a look at the curtain that was torn in two. Matthew tells us in chapter 27, verse 52, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. That curtain, or veil, was very thickly woven. It was a very thickly woven curtain that stood 60 feet high in Solomon's temple. So there was no way that that curtain was torn from top to bottom by human hands. Matthew tells us that at the moment of Jesus' death, that curtain rent in two. Perhaps it was the earthquake itself that tore that curtain in two. This curtain was between the holy place and the most holy place where God's throne was, where the mercy seat was. And it served as a a separation between sinful man and a holy God. The prophet Isaiah wrote, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Isaiah 59, verse 2. Only the high priest could enter into that place where God was, the Holy of Holies. And he could only enter there once a year to make atonement for the people by sprinkling blood on the mercy seat. The author of Hebrews tells us, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never be. The same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers, having been cleaned, once cleaned, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So these sacrifices made by these people didn't provide forgiveness for their sins once and for all. They had to do this over and over and over and over again. And through this whole process, they remained separated from God. And that curtain was a constant reminder of their separation from God. The shedding of Jesus' blood through his sacrifice on the cross was sufficient for the forgiveness of sins once and for all, for all of us. When he said it's finished, what was finished was the payment for sin, meaning it was paid in full. When Jesus died and that curtain tore in two, it opened a way for us to now enter into God's holy presence. We're able now to enter into his throne room of grace. We're covered by the blood of Jesus, we're no longer separated from God. We now have access to him through Jesus. Jesus' death on the cross opened that door for us. On that day he was crucified, not only did darkness cover the land, but the earth quaked. Now Luke doesn't record the earthquake, but Matthew does. The moment Jesus died on that cross, the moment he committed his spirit to his Father in heaven, that curtain split in two and the earth You know, the day Moses received the law on Mount Sinai, the earth quaked. Now, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly or quaked. The earth may have quaked when Jesus died, signifying that the demands of the law were fulfilled in Christ. But it could also shaken because this was an earth-shaking event in humankind. That we would now have a way open to Almighty God through Jesus Christ. A way that was previously cut off from man. A way that was previously separated us from God. Jesus died so that we could have fellowship with him. <clears throat> and the fourth thing I'm going to look at in those verses is what Jesus said. Father, I commit my spirit. Now John records that Jesus said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Mark's gospel tells us that Pilate was surprised 
when they came to him and said that Jesus was already dead after only six hours of being on the cross because some prisoners lasted days on the cross during the crucifixion. But Jesus wasn't going to give up his spirit. He wasn't going to finish, he wasn't going to die rather, until what he had come to do was finished. Now that Greek phrase translated, it is finished, is to tell us testi, which means paid in full. It's an accounting term. When Jesus uttered those words, he was declaring that the debt owed by us for our sin was wiped away completely in heaven. Completely forever, once and for all. And that's the best news mankind could have ever heard, isn't it? Those three words, it is finished, changed everything. Look at verse 47. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent, and all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breast. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from, Gal from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. But Jesus had said in John's Gospel, When I and I, when I am lifted up from this earth, I will draw all people to myself. This Roman centurion had seen many crucifixions over the years, but something was different about this one. There was something different. Perhaps it was the darkness that covered the land. That certainly would get my attention. Maybe it was the earthquake that told them that Jesus was unlike anyone else who had ever been crucified before. And I'm certain in his mind, you know, just like there's no innocent people in prison, I'm sure in his mind he's never put to death an innocent man. Yet he proclaims Jesus as innocent. Notice he praises God. Not the many Roman gods that existed, but he praised the one true God. Now we don't know if he became a believer that day. It certainly would have been enough to make me a believer. But he certainly recognized that this was an ordinary thing. This was an act of God. And I wonder if he asked himself, why an innocent man would be put to death? And the answer to that question is simple. Because that one innocent man willingly went, went to his death so that the many who are guilty could be declared innocent by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, who had not consented to their decision and action. And he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. They returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath they rested according to the commandments. And we learn from Isaiah that Jesus is burial, where he's buried, is actually a fulfillment of scripture, fulfillment of prophecy rather. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy man. The tomb that he laid Jesus in was his own tomb. Now John gives us a little more detail. He tells us that Joseph of Arimathea was actually a disciple of Jesus. But because he feared the Jews, he kept that fact a secret. And there are still people today. There are Jews, there are Palestinians, there are Muslims who are disciples of Jesus, but because of what it will cost them, cost them even their lives, to admit that they're followers of Jesus, they keep it a secret. I remember we were in Israel one time eating at a, at a Palestinian restaurant, and I, and I was witnessing to one of the waiters there. And he just kept kind of blowing me off and at some point he came and sat next to me and he leaned over and whispered in my ear he says I believe I believe that Jesus is the Messiah but if my family ever found out that I was a believer they would kill me so it's understandable that he kept it a secret because it would cost him everything John also tells us Nicodemus was there that he brought the myrrh and the aloes to anoint Jesus with enough spices by the way to anoint a king those two men risked 
everything that day to take Jesus down from that cross. Because when word of this got back to the Sanhedrin, they would have been put out of the temple. It cost them their old way of life to have new life in Christ Jesus. And so there's a lot going on around the crucifixion. So much that we might miss the glory and the power and the might of God on display that day on the cross. Now you would think that the glory of God would be displayed in the darkness and in the earthquake not in the cross. And we may think, how could God's glory be in the cross? Jesus was crucified. He suffered there and died. And it must have looked to the enemy that day like God had nothing left to work with, that God was defeated, that his plan for salvation was thwarted by the death of the Savior, that God's glory and power and might were reduced to suffering and weakness. But God's glory wasn't revealed that day in the earthquake or in the darkness. And sometimes the glory of God is concealed. It's concealed in the suffering. It's concealed beneath weakness. You know, it may have appeared to some who witnessed this crucifixion that God had nothing to do with this. That this man, Jesus, had come to nothing. And the fact that he's hanging on a cross now proves that. God's glory would be revealed in the cross of Jesus. God's glory would be revealed in the suffering and death of his son. Jesus being stripped of everything and put on the cross wasn't failure or defeat. It was an overwhelming victory. Did you know that God can take what we consider failures and defeats and turn them into victories in our lives? Did you know that God can do more through us and in us when he has less, less to work with? The more God has to work with, the less he can do in us. We tend to believe that the more we have to contribute, the more we can offer God our righteousness, the more God can use us, when the exact opposite is true. The more we decrease, the more he can increase in us. Therefore, the more he can do with us and through us. The weaker we are, the more perfect God's strength is made in our weakness. When we're empty... That's when he fills us. To prove that, just turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I've always said, if you don't believe that first verse in the Bible, then you will never be able to understand the rest of the Bible. In the beginning, God. And from the, that point on, it's all about God doing an amazing work. That Hebrew word for created is borrowed. And it means creating something out of nothing. There was nothing but darkness and formlessness, but God spoke a word and spoke life into the darkness. When we come to God emptied of self, and that's the only way we can come to him, because we have nothing to offer God in our flesh. We have no righteousness. There's nothing good in us. God then can take us then and speak his word into us and create something out of nothingness. At the cross, God spoke life into that darkness. He spoke life into us at the death of his son. God's power and might and glory was shouting from the cross that day for all who were listening to hear. God's glory wasn't in the darkness. God's glory wasn't in the earthquake. It was in the suffering and weakness of our Savior on the cross. You know, when Elijah the prophet wanted to see the glory of God, God told him, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. And a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in an earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in a fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. A still, small whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Elijah expected to see the glory of the Lord in the wind, in the fire, in the earthquake. That's where we would expect to find it, right? Just like we would expect to find God's glory in the darkness and in the earthquake on the death of Jesus. But God's glory was in the still, small voice of God. His glory shouted through that whisper. 
God's glory was in the still small voice of Jesus on the cross as he said, it is finished. A voice weakened by pain and dehydration. A voice that whispered those three words. Those three words shouted God's mercy and grace and love into us. Now, none of this happened by chance. It was all planned before the foundation of the world. The cross was even foreshadowed in the wilderness. In the book of Numbers, chapter 21, the people spoke out against God and against Moses, and they were complaining that they dragged them out into the wilderness to die. And they had been complaining for quite some time, complaining that they wanted to return to Egypt, to go back home because they were comfortable there. They wanted to go back to their old life. After you've known Jesus, I don't know how anybody can want to go back to their own life, their old life. So God sent serpents as a judgment against them, and many died from, from being bitten by the serpents. The serpent was a symbol of sin and judgment and death. So Moses intercedes for the people, and God tells him to fashion a pole and put a bronze serpent on it, and those who looked upon the serpent lifted up would be healed, and those who did not would die. Hundreds of years later, after this had happened, Jesus has a conversation with Nicodemus. And he tells him, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Isaiah had predicted that very same thing. Hundreds of years before that, he said, Behold, my servant shall act wisely, he shall be high and lifted up. He shall be exalted or glorified. Jesus and Isaiah were speaking of the cross. Now, lifted up in the Bible has a dual meaning. First, it means for us, of course, the lifting up of Jesus on the cross. But second, it means the glorification and exaltation of Jesus as he's high and lifted up. Now, Jesus used that phrase lifted up before in John's Gospel. So Jesus said to them, when you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. John chapter 8, verse 28. Again, in John chapter 12, we read, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And when you put all this together, you see that what Jesus was saying was, when you see me lifted up on the cross, know that I am the Messiah. Messiah who came to save the world, to draw all people to him. He was glorified and exalt, and exalt and exalted in the crucifixion, not defeated. He was glorified, not defeated. He was lifted up, not beaten down. And when we look to the cross, we have a choice, just as the Israelites did in the desert. We can look to Jesus as our Savior and live, or we can ignore him and die. And the problem with so, for so many people today is that we'd rather look at They'd rather look at themselves and trust in their own good works to save them. Just like the Israelites in the, in the wilderness, we cannot save ourselves. There was nothing they could do to save ourselves. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. We need to do just as they did. Look to Jesus and be saved. That's the sole reason he endured the cross, so that we could be saved, because there is no other way. God laid out his plan of salvation in what has become one of the most widely quoted verses in the world. Tim Tebow used to wear it every football game. John 3.16. Now you all know John 3.16, so we won't read it. And I just want to focus on two words in that, in, that, in that verse. The word so, God so loved, and the word world, God so loved the world. That word so in the Greek is hotos, and that has a couple of meanings. It can mean degree, so the degree of love toward us as in God so loved the world, right? And the uh, or could also have the meaning of the manner in which. So God loved the world in this way that he gave his only begotten son. Now the Greek word for cosmos can only have one meaning, and that's the world. God so loved the world in this way that he gave his only begotten son to die for. And Jesus so loved you and I that he willingly gave his life as an innocent man on the cross that day to set you and I who are guilty of sin free from the wages of those sin and when we look to Jesus as Lord and Savior lifted up high on the cross 
bearing the curse of our sin, you will live. You know, Jesus' last words on the cross was, it is finished. It is finished. It is finished for all those who put their trust in Jesus as Savior. There's nothing left for us to do. He's done it all. Our sins have been forgiven. We've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But for those who haven't, they remain yet in their sin. They remain unforgiven. And please don't let the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on that cross come to nothing in your life. Because it cost him everything, everything to save us. So make a decision today to give up your old life for a new life in Christ Jesus. Amen? Please stand. Lord, your word.